every time I tell this story, I just start smiling uh, because it all comes back. Okay, uh, it was 1994. I was working as a firefighter in Santa Barbara. I was at Station 11 and something for nausea. She pushed him into the IV port and, uh, you know, I kind of was sitting up. I was get, you know, getting dressed. My wife was there and I was like, I think I can go home. And she goes, nope, the doctor hasn't even seen you yet. And these are orders for everybody. Anyway, she pushed it and I keeled over. And my wife said uh, that, you know, it really scared them. Uh, they came in and they Narcan'd you. And Narcan is something that felt like. So I'd fly along and then all of a sudden I landed. I landed in a place that was solid. It had indirect lighting and there were gurneys around and there was equipment that was hanging from the ceiling. It was like a facility or a clinic or something. And right in front of me there were, there were beings. There were these three short little hooded guys and they looked equalized. It's like I was being beamed out of there and I was going to another channel I was going to another frequency and it was a descending feeling and I dropped away into darkness. It wasn't a good place. It wasn't um, some place you wanted to be. It was lonely and it was dismal and you didn't want to stay there. Then I, I, I was back in my body. the light started to appear. And that's when I realized that this was death. This was my death. When I died, I was 31. What I experienced from that moment on just changed my life forever. It has shown the impact that I had during my life on the world around me. It wasn't judgmental, it was more subjective. It was, you know, this is, the energy that you put into the world during your life, and I love you. I'm part of you. I went in for a routine hysterectomy, and it was during or after the hysterectomy that I actually experienced my death. I was out of recovery and in my private room. Enter an unearthly beautiful realm. They may see their deceased relatives at, the, at loving reunions, even deceased pets. By this time, they're typically feeling overwhelming positive emotions. They really feel like this realm that seems unearthly to us is really their home. When I came down and looked at my physical body lying on the bed, then I knew that I had died and I thought, Oh my God, I'm dead. I don't know how I died, but I'm, I'm dead. I, I could see the figure moving with arms spread out like this, and he was Jesus Christ. And I reached for him and put my arms around him as he held me too. And he said, it's not yet your time. It's not yet your time. Some angels or guardians or guards or supporters of him and me came. There were three women and he said, show her everything that she needs to know. Then they took me to a of fist sized plots. It scared the entire nursing staff. It scared my family. I mean, it's scary when you see that much blood coming out of a person. But what was odd was that my vitals were improving. I was actually stabilizing, not getting worse. The doctors still don't know what caused my illness to begin with, why my symptoms. When I had my experience, I was a true atheist, true atheist. I didn't believe in any kind of religion. I didn't believe in, in anything. I thought this was all foo-foo. I am an engineer. I was up on a bucket truck. We were running some electrical lines. For and it was a bit of a painful experience because I feel like something was being ripped off of me. And it felt like I was falling forever. And when I finally hit what I would call ground, it kind of ended for a second and then she kind of said, you gotta keep going. It, it just started out kind of out of nowhere and I was having some autoimmune type things like fibromyalgia and rosacea in my cheeks and stuff. And But I mean, a lot of women have that. 
And uh, I was home with my daughter one day and drinking just a smoothie in the living room. And I had a history of anaphylaxis to shellfish, but I hadn't had an attack in years and years. I just kind of kept those EpiPens around obligatory and you know, light and I didn't realize she had gone. And all of a sudden there was this like rumbling, thundering and like this presence shook everything that ever had been or ever would be every every planet in the cosmos just was rumbling with this energy and i could feel it in my bones and i knew something big was coming never saw a person um and i always refer to god as he just because the energy felt very masculine to me but i, I mean i can't say with certainty that this was a man and i don't think god is a man i think it's I don't know, he was this mix of masculine and feminine because he was nurturing, but that power makes you think, you know, at least me as a traditional person, it makes me think of a man. You know, he came to me and I heard him say this telepathic thing. He said, I am. And that was it. That's all he had to say. I'm like, man, you're the stuff. You just come up to somebody and say, I am. And you're like, yeah, you are. There's a resonance and it's the key of D is what it sounded like to me. And, um, no, it's hard to talk about. Um, it just had this vibration to it that was alive that just went through me. And it was, I could feel it just coursing through every part of me. And and so I'm there with him and immediately I, I got kind of scared. I'm like, oh no, I wasn't ready for this. He's gonna look at all the stuff that I'm I've done wrong that I'm so ashamed of. Information from God. You know, you were here. There's times you doubt that near death experience because so many people doubt it. And he's like, no, you were here, and, and I'm making manifest the things that I promised you. And I'm almost like, wow. The other thing I learned there was, we have this really screwed up definition of good and bad. To us, good is when nothing is wrong and everything is right. And in the spiritual realm, good is forward motion. I saw all the craziness, all the confusion in the first series of pictures. I'm not trying to freak people out. I'm trying to say we're going through a big, big change. And there's a reason for it. We can't change the chaos the world's going through now. And the reason we're going through it, one simple. Uh, but that evening when I went back to my apartment, a little duplex with my roommates, uh, within about an hour of talking, I started feeling what other people were going to ask and say. I went to sleep that night, or tried to. I couldn't sleep at all. My mind was racing like never before. My roommate came walking in, reading the morning newspaper, and I saw the headlines through his eyes. Ending. Now, my body's down there on Guadalupe Street. People hollering and screaming and freaking out. Planets. Galaxies it's expanding bigger and bigger and bigger, went through the solar system, went through the whole universe, got to the edge of the universe, went outside of it. And in the book, I describe what I felt like was a level of consciousness that I called the colors, it seemed to name itself that. It's a level of con It was like you just rock it, you just get it. You know, you just, you don't doesn't have to be in English or anything. You just understand it because you're part of it. And all of a sudden I realized, maybe I'm not part of it. Maybe I'm observing it. And I was pulled back, back through this tunnel of light and back into this universe and started collapsing into time and space. Had no idea who I was or where I was going, but I was a little apprehensive. <laughs> where I was was pretty nice. The closer I got to this solar system and then to earth, I started seeing all these flashcards, these pictures. So I'm spinning newspapers. They came in three series. The first series was what we're going through now. I saw 9-11, I saw COVID-19, I saw global warming. I saw, which I couldn't even imagine at that time, this carnage in the country. Nobody in 1977 walked around an AK-47. You know, I saw that and I couldn't believe it. I said, no, that's gotta be a hallucination. Nope, I'm not trying to freak people out. I'm trying to say we're going through a big, big change. And there's a reason for it. And I saw this because I saw all the craziness, all the confusion in the first series of pictures. The second series of pictures were the 
thousand years apiece, exploring space, solving a lot of our problems that we are headed that direction. It's a clumsy road. We got a long ways to go. That's idealized love, space, technology, no hatred. Where we are now is chaos. So there's a big gap between <laughs> where we are and where we're headed. The third set of pictures was about me. And then all, all of a sudden I see my body and I jump back into my body, kind of like home. Well, it was the middle of a Guadalupe street and people are screaming and hollering and the driver, the first thing I noticed is long red hair hanging over my face. And this driver's leaning over me, scream, please, ambulance, emergency room, put me in a 10 day mandatory commitment to a psychiatric hospital here. I didn't resist at all. All the patients are calling me Mr. Smiles. I'm happy all the time. I'm playing piano for them. I'm entertaining. I spent 10 days there, and at the end of 10 days, the psychiatrists all get together. They talk to me, and they decide whether I'm going to have to stay another 10 days or I'm okay. And I said, look, I know you folks don't. In between that is a experience in separateness in some form or another. So I feel like the luckiest person on the planet because of the experience and because they finally told me why I had it. Never occurred to me, curiosity. Saw over the next hundred years, and there are so many images I saw so quickly that oftentimes I don't recognize them until I see the incident. I, I can't lay out for certainty exactly what's going to happen when. There was so much information so fast. We can't change the chaos the world's going through now. And the reason we're going through it, one simple reason. We all have to see the holes in the boat, the flaws in ourselves and in our systems before we can fix them. It's the opportunity that life is giving us to see what needs to be fixed. Faith was materialism. What I believed in all of my PhD friends and all of my friends believed that if you can't measure it, see it, weigh it, count it, it simply doesn't exist. So when I was dying, People ask me if I prayed, and it's like, I'm trying to explain to you, like the last thing in the world I would have done was pray. I would have, I would have sooner jumped off the Eiffel Tower than pray. It would be a lot more pleasant down there than it is. In their separation from God, it also means all the good things that God gives us, like um, there's no birds or butterflies or flowers or sunshine or rain or wind. There's no candy. There's no chocolate cake. There's no ice cream. It's pretty bleak what psychologists have found when they cage a bunch of animals in a cage for a period of time. They start gnawing on each other because that's the only gratification they get. But, and I just yell out into the darkness, pure desperation, Jesus, please save me. Without the faintest idea whether there was a Jesus or not a Jesus or whether he liked me or didn't like me or, you know, I mean, I had, I had nothing except this faint hope that it might be true. This impossibly bright light, like if it was actually light light, it would have, it would have burned me. I was like, you know, so overwhelmed by the brightness of the light and its beauty. And then like, I looked down at myself and I saw gore and I was like, ew, I had been eviscerated. Okay. Um, not pretty. And out of this light came hands and arms and he touched me. And when he touched me, three things happened. One is all the gore just started to disappear and I became whole. The other thing that happened was I was filled with ecstasy instead of being um, simply just nothing but pain from head to foot. Now all of a sudden that the pain goes away and I'm filled with ecstasy. And Lastly, and most importantly, um, I experienced a love that I had never known that existed. And you know what he did? He laughed and laughed and laughed. He thought it was really funny. And I thought, oh, he thinks I'm funny. He said, yeah, you're real funny. And I was like, he thinks I'm funny because nobody thinks I'm funny. I mean, like, I have a wicked sense of humor, but it's like it's New England. It's very dry. You know, I make like a lot of jokes and people look at me like, what's your problem? Like we started talking and he kind of interrupted our conversation, which is all telepathically. Um, he had a, a young male voice. He said, I got a bunch of people I want you to meet. And so he called out with tone, musical tone. And they came and there was a group of them and they formed a survey circle around us. And he said, they've recorded your life 
and they want to show you your life. So we pr proceeded to watch my life and that was the whole thing. It was uh, brutal and I made them very disappointed and very sad, but I got the point. It was real simple. We were here, we were supposed to love each other and I completely missed it. I thought my life was about being the most famous, wealthiest, important, powerful person that I could possibly be. I mean, I wanted it all. Um, he said, do you have any questions? And I said, yeah, I got a million questions. So I asked him everything I could think of to answer. And he answered everything. I've never told anybody everything because some of it gets like a little esoteric. And, um, you know, I've gotten in trouble for stuff. I mean, I mean, I've had people tell me that I'm the devil and I'm an apostasy and I'm um, I've had been accused of things just, I'm just like real simple stuff. Like for example, I mean, I'll give you an example of like um, when babies are either aborted or stillborn or die when they're very young, um, they just get another chance at life. And, and people have been furious with me and call me all kinds of names because Jesus told me that. And it's like, I'm sorry if you don't like Jesus plan. No, no he doesn't throw babies into hell. He not only told me, but he showed me and we visited some places that the universe is full of um, intelligent beings and uh, varied life forms. And that, in fact, this world is one of the lowest of them all. There's a lot more spiritual, kind, good, loving and intelligent beings all over the universe. I asked Jesus, and so what happens to people when they die? And he said, and he said it's a really big problem because um, he said, Usually when people die, they don't know they've died because like when they were dying, they were in suffering. And when they died, the he was right again. I've been doing this thing for over 30 years since, well, 33 years now since 85. And yeah, if you seek love and beauty, you find love and beauty. If you seek cruelty and ugliness, you find cruelty and ugliness. But I'm telling you, the, the love and the beauty is in everywhere and in everyone including people that do not strike you immediately as either loving or beautiful. In what they um, called the recovery area at the hospital in Paris, the room was kind of dark. It was daytime, but the, the lights weren't on. The room lit up. And this young man, beautiful young man, in his like mid or late 20s, it appeared blonde, wearing hospital scrubs, pale green scrubs with the V-neck scrub sleeves and sneakers. He comes into the room and he goes, Howard, how are you? I'm like, whoa. Once again, perfect English. No, kind of a kind of a surprise in a French hospital. Long and short of it was, he said, I'm gonna be watching over you and um, I wanna assure you that everything's gonna be okay, but you've got a long recovery ahead of you. Um, but I will always be around. And I said, great, great. It was a big shift for me as a scientist to all of a sudden have my entire world flipped upside down. I couldn't unsee this. I couldn't unex. Right. I know what a hallucination is like. This is not one of them. I was a, a scientist, a science writer. I did a lot of technical writing. I really didn't believe in anything other than, you know, this physical existence at home for our souls. And I just wept. I felt like I was weeping or crying. It was just so powerful and moving. And finally, there was a, what felt like a female presence kind of come into my, the area of where I was standing. It was really hard for me to get a clear view of her face, sort of a little fuzzy, but she gave me this big, amazing hug and told me that she was going to teach me what I needed to know in order to go back, to my whole NDE was like I was out hiking in the mountains. That's what it was like. That's where I like to be. They took me out mm -hmm. in the mountains. And she asked me to just sit down at the edge of the pond and touch the surface of the pond and see what happens. By this time, I was really weary of lessons. I just wanted <laughs> to be done with it. And because um, it seemed like forever. This was actually one of the last lessons that I had. And... She put her hands on her hips and she said, well, you just do it, please. <laughs> the surface of the water and just sat back and watched. And there were many lessons in this. So we'll talk a little bit about these. But 
on top of all of those little ripples all across the surface of the pond, when I looked out there, it was my life. I, I don't know that I would have talked about this with anybody else. It was a big shift for me as a scientist to all of a sudden have my entire world flipped upside down. I wanted it to go back to the way it was, but I knew I couldn't unsee this. I couldn't unexperience right. it. This was about a year before he passed. He was a big hunter. He loved hunting. He loved fishing. And he told me he was bound and determined to go hunting. He's so ill and so frail. He can barely walk, you know, and I'm like, this is not, not a recipe for, you know, a good day. And was like, heard music. And it was not human music. <laughs> this was angels singing divine music, like beautiful choral music that we can't produce here on this planet. And I, I couldn't hear anything else. It was so powerful. And I turned to my partner, I said, do you hear that? He's like, what? Because he didn't hear it, I did. And along with that music, I felt and almost heard utter joy, my dad's joy. Thought maybe, just maybe, my brother and my mom had put on 